All right, guys, welcome to One Life Podcast. Here with Kai, a fellow Aussie. Yep. <laughs> Thank you for being here, man. Yeah, absolutely, man. It's my pleasure. I reached out. You jumped straight in. I love that attitude. Yeah, well, I mean, that's kind of just us as a nation, really. Yeah, just it jump really in is. head first and, and don't look back. Mm. <laughs> so, businessman, personal trainer, yep. nutritionist, yep. and then your competitive bodybuilder, just scaling back to men's physique. Yes, that's correct. So, you live and breathe this stuff. Yeah, and it's been quite a long time. Um, you know, I first started out in the industry when I was just fresh 18. So I've been doing this about 17 years. How old are you, how old are you now? 35. 35. Yeah, about okay. to turn 36, unfortunately. I just um, turned 43, dude. Oh, well, there you go. That's even more unfortunate. Sneaks no, up. <laughs> <laughs> it sneaks up on you. It definitely does. Um, but yeah, no, like, you know, the years have been great. I've changed a lot over the years. My mm. views, my concepts, what I've wanted to do personally. But the overall sort of vision for me over the whole 17 years is, has never changed. And that's just always bringing it back to people. Um, so well, helping others. You helping mean? others, yeah. Making sure that they've got the right information, making sure that they've got the most productive information for themselves, you know, to make it a nice, easy process because so it wasn't been... that for me. Oh, that's, a whole, that's a whole different conversation, right? Yeah. So you've been training and helping people since the age of 18. Yes. Oh, that's so amazing. So on and off. It's, it's Go- been gotcha. like an on and off thing, but very, very full time from about 24, five 24 25 gotcha yeah so i did it for eight years yep. and then i won't i won't go back yeah and it was a cool experience i learned a lot i grew a lot but mm-hmm. it's not something i wanted to pursue for forever yeah so you're like you're right in the mix of it yeah i mean it's it's one of those things uh i got into it at a time when like there was no social media there was none of that well that's what stuff. i wanted to touch on here because yeah. we, we started at a time where you walked up to the biggest guy in the gym and you asked him questions. A hundred percent. And that was the only way to learn. Besides mm-hmm. that, body button mag was promoting protein powder, yeah. which used to be like cake mix. Yep. If yep. you remember that. Oh, man. Disgusting. I like you literally this, chew it. I literally used to drink this mass gain shake because my first ever job in the fitness, like nutrition side of things was at GNC. Mm. Um, and they had this protein shake there it was 900 calories per serving Damn, and it was serving. one giant scoop like a giant dump truck <laughs> mixer that you couldn't even like get in and out of the tub effectively yeah, yeah, yeah. and you mix that thing up it was like drinking mud and it didn't matter how much water you put with it it was legitimate you mud that turn you were upside down oh, right? kind of like, like, like the um what's uh the ice cream place in america Oh. Then they, they make it for you and they turn it upside down like it doesn't drop. Oh, I had done it. You haven't know. seen that? No, I haven't seen it yet. <laughs> it Surprisingly, I'm, I'm an ice cream connoisseur. <laughs> it reminds you of that. Yeah, so you and I just kind of like figuring it out, failing forwards. It's never been easier. No. I mean, you go to your page, there's so much damn information for free. Yes. Which is like 25 years of experience. Yeah. And it's it's, it's a lot for people to sort of, it's, it's difficult for people, right? There is so many people out there these days doing, you know, what I do, what you've done in the past. And I think the fitness industry as a whole has evolved so much to not just people who are professionals, but typically just moving to that influential, you know, side Mm. of things, you know, helping people through their journeys, helping to inspire people through their journeys. And they're two very different things, Mm. you know, like you've got this person on this side that's learning and, and growing as they evolve through what they're doing. Mm. You've got people who are, you know, genuinely educated, have been to school for years, have put themselves through multiple different courses and things like that. And also with their skill set and their knowledge, their years in the industry have been able to evolve all of that information into a true skill set. And apply it to themselves, Exactly. Right? Not just themselves, yeah, but, you know, other to everybody else. So Because, yeah, knowing and doing is two different things, right? Exactly. And I'm a big believer, like, yeah, you can read a book or you can learn nutrition, but you've got to diet. Yes. You've got to go through that, that hell. Absolutely. And the other part that, you know, I really like to tell people is that your journey is your journey. Mm. Your journey is going to be different to your best friend's journey and even your boyfriend's journey or your husband or your wife. It doesn't matter. Every single person is unique. Mm. And that's why it's so important to understand that, yes, these people are incredibly motivating, but these people over here with all the true information are the ones that you know mm. you really need to start looking at. So find that true information and and make it work for yourself. Exactly. Yeah. And there's no right or wrong diet. There's no right or wrong there way isn't. of training. It's what works for you. It's what works for you. And you know, like I've preached over the years. I've got my ways of doing things. Mm. Obviously, but things you've that refined that since the age of eighteen. Right? Exactly. You know, and I've been able to apply a lot of the knowledge and the information, the concept behind that to mm. other people in the thousands over my years. 
And for the people who actually apply that, you know, particular methodology, they're winning and they're succeeding and they're getting the results that they want. But one thing I have learned over the years too is that not everybody wants to be exactly like me. Mm. So I've even tried harder again just to refine that process a little bit more to take it to more of a lifestyle version that people can still enjoy themselves a little bit. Um, and then, you know, obviously you've got your more hardcore people, your competitors yeah. who still need that strict, you know, yeah. regime. So it's been it's been fun to let my sort of my business and, and my thought process evolve over time as well. But I still have to say, like, the passion goes back to that really serious side. Mm, yeah. Okay, I like that. And then the problem, we talk about this a lot, that you got these guys doing this, like, knee lift, little two-minute exercise on how to get abs. Yes. And we both know the only way to get abs is dieting over a period of time. Yes. And this all that fluff, it makes it so hard to know who to believe and who to turn to. Well, and what makes you credible and not him. And mm, Yeah, I think the, the point to that is you really have to look – deeper into that person what their experience really is um you know the thing that i find these days especially with social media and uh instagram you know your influencers and things like that they have a strong point because they look fantastic but they also could be 22 more not even just 22 but they may have just been like that their whole life yeah you know and and you know it's it's not like they've been through any major tremendous struggle like mm. You know, I see a lot of skinny girls posting up pictures and um, they're really skinny at one point and then they've got all this muscle and it's like, that's a fantastic job. Mm. But show me someone who's 450 pounds, who's got themselves right down to a manageable weight where they're now healthy, more comfortable, because that's the real problem. Yeah. That's the real problem that we face here. Mm. And, you know, as much as the person who's always been like that may still have some credibility because they've got themselves from this point to that point. In my opinion, that's a far easier journey to manage mm. than someone who is struggling in their mindset, struggling in their, it, in their brain. That's the first thing comes to my exactly, mind. It, it's know. not physical. It's, it's all mental, it is. right? It's incredibly mental. Mm. You uh, don't get overweight. Yeah. I'm not taking away from people who you know have been skinny and gained weight because it's still an incredible mental challenge mm. you know, gaining weight especially as a female. Mm. So I have a tremendous amount of respect for the women out there who are doing that because, you know, I've got a wife myself and she struggles with the eating more to gain size because she doesn't want to look fluffy and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, and it's yeah. an incredible mental battle that's put on just by society itself. Mm. No, that's interesting. So, I want to, um, Australia, America, what, what do you think? You think Australians are just as bad as America as far as the BCD, the sugar, the diabetes? <laughs> I what's your thoughts like being a strain and man i'll be honest with you like since coming here i've just encountered a lot more people that don't really care for themselves mm. do you in think it's more acceptable in this country than it is back <sighs> home to eat fast food more often and well it, it's everywhere like you can't it's very hard to down, avoid right especially in las vegas the street Mm. without running into a mcdonald's i literally had this conversation with my wife yesterday mm. and i said to her i was like you know like you walk down the street here there's a mcdonald's on every corner where i grew up going to mcdonald's was a full day expedition because you had to drive an hour to get there where are you from i'm from port macquarie new south wales gotcha so i'm from Alabama. well actually south of there like an hour south of port macquarie okay. right on the coast where there's like 350 people mm. so i'm from aldala which was an hour away from Nara, yep. where the closest mcdonald's was yep so mcdonald's was was just not even a thing it was yeah like and if it was or... yeah it was so random right yeah exactly i always tell people i've never had a mcdonald's birthday and that blows people's mind yeah. <laughs> you probably haven't either right? i had one. Oh, you I had have one when i was no i don't even think it was mine i think it was my brother's there you go you know, right it might have been his his 10th birthday or something like that. But it's a standard like thing that. in this country. Yeah. And, you know, I was six years old. That's when I was first introduced to a McDonald's mm. and it was right before I moved from New South Wales to Queensland. Mm. But, you know, even in Queensland, mate, like where, where I was working originally um, before I moved to the United States, there was a McDonald's in the town and that was it. But McDonald's in Australia, again, is very different to McDonald's here. Mm. So all the food here is just completely different. You can taste the quality difference. You can see the preparation That's, difference. It's so good to hear that from yeah. somebody else. Because I, I think it, I believe it. Yeah. The food quality here is awful. It, it's, it's pretty tragic. I mean, you get a lot of bang for your buck. Don't get yeah, me wrong. Yeah, you absolutely do. I love the fact that you got a lot of value for a lot, a lot less money mm. here. But at least you know in Australia when you go into a McDonald's and you're going to buy that burger, it's going to look like the picture. 
you know so <laughs> yeah it's it's very 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 different you know what comes to mind is um breakfast in america opposed to breakfast in australia yeah breakfast in america is just brown yes and then australia it's eggs and it's scrambled eggs it's got color in it it's got yep. vegetables in it you yep. don't really get that here no i've found it really difficult like because breakfast is actually my favorite meal to mm. like have a massive cheat meal on and i find it really disappointing that everywhere you go something's just got to be covered in cheese mm. like as much as i that's love that's another cheese, thing too right cheese on everything cheese standard everything it's like or, with uh, Vegemite, whipped cream know? on everything too right yeah we don't do that back yeah, home no or another one is um free refills yes we don't have free refills we don't have free refills that is the biggest cause of obesity in this country i think it is a massive massive problem um but in saying that, like when we're looking at percentages, we've got 27 million people in Australia mm. versus 36 million people in LA. You know, like it's absolutely insane yeah, that there's that many are. people in such a confined area versus so many people that are spread out. Mm. And I think that that plays a lot into it because obviously Australia, it's, it's hard to populate in areas that aren't like yeah, a capital what, city yeah like it's it's just I always difficult. tell people there's no color a river with a no dam. exactly <laughs> it's all desert out there <laughs> so it's i think it's just harder for our areas to be so densely populated with fast food options because there's just not as many people to service mm, them gotcha yeah That's so you've got your major ones your kfc mcdonald's hungry jacks um dominoes i, I think that's yeah, and that's kind of, there's no Taco Bell, Del Tacos, mm, any of that stuff. Like KFC is probably the number one, two place in Australia, right? Yeah, I'd have to Whereas, say that. How many people you know at KFC here? Uh, Nobody. None. I'm, I'm surprised not KFC had, exists. Still. Exactly. I drove past KFC the other day and I was like, oh, shit, I forgot that exists. Because no one has it here. <laughs> it's not you mentioned go Chick-fil-A through. or something. That's a whole different story. Yeah, so Chick-fil-A or you've got, you know, McDonald's still. Like, mm. I, I don't know. I've been to McDonald's once since I've been here in, the, in America mm. and it was here in Vegas and it literally tasted like I just licked the inside of a salt bag. And <laughs> I just, I couldn't even get past the fact that they call it a filet fish like, yeah, yeah. That just mind boggles me. But you know, what's, um, what's your thoughts? It seems like the standards here, it seems like you can get away with whatever you want in this country. So as far as like uh, food colorings, preservatives, additives, a lot of places it's illegal in other countries. Yes. Here, it's free for all. Free for all. It's kind of scary, isn't it? It is because of a number of different reasons. Like, and, and I'll bring this back a little bit more to fitness now. I'm talking like supplements. Whew. That's not governed very well either. It's is it? really dangerous. But not even supplements. I'm talking about like food, like allergens and things like that too. Mm. So if you're looking at gluten, for an example, this is one that I like to bring up with all of my clients because a lot of people here don't know that they may have a gluten intolerance. They, they may have celiacs and wonder why they're always getting sick. Mm. And they're like, I only eat gluten-free products. But I can actually guarantee you that nearly every product in the United States that says it's gluten-free still has 30 parts per million really? of gluten in it. Where Australia, on the other hand, is it's legally not allowed to have gluten-free on the label unless it's one part per million. Gotcha. So, the, so those uh, 30 parts are tragic for a celiac. Mm. And a lot of people here don't know that. And it's just the rules not being tight enough, right? No, it's There's not. So many like, loopholes. How can you call something free, gluten-free, mm. when it's still very prevalent within That's, the actual product? And it's like that on a lot of different things, isn't it? A hundred percent. So yeah. supplements have it. Like an example, I'm not going to name the name of the company, but you know they had uh, gluten-free protein cookie here in the united states um it was delicious i used to eat them all the time i still will to this day but when they got a final you know finally got that contract in australia they said nah you either change the label and take gluten-free off it or it's not coming gotcha so they had to completely relabel the product in australia and when i went i picked one up and it was the last time I went back to Australia and I was on the Gold Coast mm. and I picked this thing up at World Gym and I was like, get the fuck out of here. Are these not gluten-free anymore? And the dude was like, oh, nah, like they, they've never been gluten-free. And I was like, fuck out of here. <laughs> so, you know, like you, all of these things. You really got to do your research here, right? You have to. That's And I have another friend now. We have a uh, fitness friend of mine and we talk about this a lot. You really got to dive deep on everything, every single thing you pick up. Yes. It's kind of scary. And then also like a lot of the supplements that you can buy here over the counter, you cannot get. Back no. Home. 
What's that? It's that white one three dimethylene that they put in the yeah dimethylethylene. Di yeah, that one. I yeah. can never say it. Meth illegal back um, home, right? It's very much illegal back home, and it comes down to the coal mining industry back there. Um, there was so many guys, literally popping positive for cocaine and meth, going to work while they were going to drive these giant trucks, and they couldn't fucking figure out why. Really? And they're like, why is this happening? So then they started talking at the pre-workouts and the guys started getting banned from coming to work with certain pre-workouts, like really? Mesomorph, when Mesomorph yeah, was yeah, really big. Yeah, yeah, that shit blew your head off. Yeah, exactly. So yeah. that had that particular ingredient in it in a very high amount. Really? So that was like one of their primary stimulants within the product. Mm. And this is at a time where it was still very experimental within that ingredient. Mm. So coal mines started having to shut down because... Guys were getting sent home sick <laughs> for three days like wow. because they tested positive on a drug test. Then they had to get retested at home. Then they were having to pay them for the drive out, the drive home, the three days they sat at home, their doctor's visit, really? because they would test clear when they got back to the, the doctor. So, and the coal industry was just bilging really? billions of dollars. I did not know that. So it, What's, so it started to spike the attention of government then and they're like, okay, gotcha. we need to put a stop to this because obviously the government's very reliant on the coal industry. Mm. Is so the ingredient in it is a part of a what drug? Um, it just tests positive for cocaine. Really? And it tests positive sometimes for meth. That's got to be saying something, right? That's well, I mean, it's mind altering. Mm. You've got to look at it that way. Cocaine gives you that pick, not that I've done it. Um, it it's one of those things that you, just gives you that little edge, that pickup mm. where you're so hyper-focused and lays it in. That's the, that's the job of a stimulant. Mm. So the stronger they can make that for someone or the stronger they can get it as close to that next level of narcotic, mm. they're going to take it to that level until they're told they're not allowed to do that anymore. Gotcha. So it's, it's all about that's what's going to sell. That's nuts. And then uh, ephedrine being another one, right? Yeah, ephedra. Like ephedra, or... ephedra was obviously speed mm. um, or a basis of speed. Blew my mind you could just buy that over the counter. I, I When I first got here, I was like, gee, I've tried the original um, lipodrine tablets that mm. had ephedra yeah. in it. And you, you couldn't sit still on this shit. Like, and the heart palpitations and the anxiety that you would get, you just didn't want to stop moving. Mm. So you can see why they wanted people to have it because it was actually working. Mm. Like I know plenty of guys, fighters specifically, to yeah. drop weight will take speed and then wrap themselves in glad wrap and just run. Just, oh, Jesus. And it's like safe. just for a weight cut. You yeah. Know? And, and because it works and they need it done right then and there. So what do people want? They want their results tomorrow they wanted it yesterday yeah, yeah. grand scheme reality of things yeah. it just was never going to happen then mm. they want it tomorrow though if they're going to take something today they want it tomorrow mm. and that's still such a massive issue with society because they're going to continue to buy into that shit and it's going to slowly just keep knocking people off left right and center that's uh that's crazy it's so it's so nice to talk to you about this stuff because <laughs> i mean being a strain i always feel like oh yeah i'm over exaggerating but i'm really not it's, no it's pretty nuts. It's, it is. But you have to understand like our perspective on it too is we're basing it off where we're from, what we grew up with, mm. what luxuries we had. You know, the thing about America, there's just so many people here. Mm. There, there really is. And there's so many people from different backgrounds, origins, countries, religions. Everybody has a different viewpoint. Everybody's yeah. perspective is completely, you know, their own. So what we grew up with and what we're conditioned to, this is what they're conditioned to. Yeah, and that's one thing I always talk about in America. You don't really hear about the rest of the world. No. Because it goes back to what you're saying. It's such a big country. There's so many people. There's so much going on in this country. News in Australia. Five minutes of Australian news and then England, America, South yep. Africa. And we're so worried about the rest of the world without even trying. We yep. don't go looking for it. But in America, you got to go looking for it. Yeah. And we all travel. We all want to go. We yep. always want to leave the country as soon as we can just yep. because we're so isolated isolated yeah whereas in america everything you need is here you yeah. don't really have a need to to to, to, to get to up leave. and leave right no and i think that's part of the the big issue is like so many people from here haven't seen the world and they haven't experienced different things for the few that do get out and go and explore you can just you can feel it within them my wife's one of them she's been mm. over to she's europe american, and, is she? yeah she's american mm. and you know she's been over to europe and she's done a little tour over there and had her fun and you know, that really helped to change her perspective on a lot of things because she's had that 
worldly view now. Mm. Whereas people don't necessarily have the same opportunity to get out of here to get to other places mm. just because it's not within their capacity. Mm. You know, you've got and to then, look at what we get in Australia. We get four to six weeks of paid paid leave every year if you've got a full time job. Mm. Maternity leave. Maternity leave is extremely huge. Mm. We've got free medical, healthcare. Yeah, medical. Like, we've got so many things. There's no things guns that, shooting people up. Exactly. There's, you know, mm. there's so many benefits in Australia just for being a citizen. Mm. Whereas here, people are just neglected because there's so damn many of them. Mm. It'd be impossible for this country with the amount of debt that it's in to be able to, you know, forecast free healthcare for the whole country. Mm. And it's, it's just, uh, it all comes down to population. The veteran thing is super sad here too. Yeah. That really upsets me. Yeah. Like people, have served, people have kind of sacrificed a lot. And Definitely. Just, yeah. Definitely. Super scary. But, you know, we, we are very blessed to come from where we come from, but we're also very blessed to be able to be in a great country like this. And I think that there's pros and cons to both. Everywhere, um, right? You know, this, this country has gotten me to a whole new level in my career that I probably never would have seen in Australia. I always say that, right? So Because the 330 million people who live here. There's so many more people that you can touch on a daily basis. Mm. There's so many more people that you can touch just through, you know, the means of social media or, or friends or, you know, references, whatever it might be. Yeah. And it seems the greater the population, obviously, there's more people to, you know, embrace what it is that you're doing as well. Mm. Which, and I remember, I remember even just playing basketball at the park here. Even just the level of basic basketball is so much fun. It, uh, it's I, insane. Yeah, I don't how even better, ask me to go and play how basketball. Much better people are at everything here yeah. because there's more population. Yep. It's uh, insane. I'm it's from a so small little town. Everyone's so damn good at everything. Well, look at, look at um, you know, traditionally... You look at any any kid going to like a sporting venue. You might come from a small town. You got one kid out of all the kids who is just exceptional at sport, mm. and they might go to a higher level. You know, the smaller the population, the smaller the chance of that actually yeah. happening is, and the greater it is when someone great does come from those small areas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it all comes down to competition. Who have you got to play against? Who have you got to hone your craft against? Mm. You look at the level of of basketball just like you said down at the park those kids have probably all grown up competing against abundance more kids Mm. that want to be just as great yeah so they're all competing against each other as much as a team sport you're still in it to be the best yeah right doesn't matter it doesn't matter whether lebron james he knows he's king dick on the lakers yeah like and he's competing every night to make sure that everybody knows who lebron james is james is he's the number one yeah so all of those kids are, are fighting for that crown yeah whereas we're coming from these places it's like this big and we've got like 18 kids and it's like oh you're all just as good as each other but one kind of stands out yeah and that's and who's that's that guy of, got to compete against that's exactly it you know he's you know so it, that's that's the way i see it no i totally agree um i totally agree <laughs> yeah i think with kids here like going and going into sport the competitive nature of it like you just look at the nfl draft Mm. how many first picks like how many picks are there I, I actually don't know but that's a lot of people that actually get picked to play mm. in the nfl every year yeah you then look at how many people actually play professional rugby league in australia it's probably the same amount that get picked every year to play in the yeah, NFL. yeah that's a good point actually yeah there is so many more people fighting for that top spot than what there is in Australia. Mm. So when you're here, you have to grind. And then you could argue how sheltered you are in Australia if you haven't left. Mate. Because if you're playing professional football, yeah, it's great in Australia, but the compared to the rest of the world, it ain't that, like soccer players, right? Mm-hmm. We're good, good soccer players. Yep. Come to a different country, World Cup, we suck. Rubbish. We're so Absolutely bad. Absolutely garbage. Because, and that goes back to just the level of com- um, competition to yep. level up. It's not there. No, and the coaching and all of that stuff, like mm. it's not there. Like you look we at coaching so teams at here it. at universities. You got a university football coach. Like when I played rugby in Australia at university, they had one coach for their rugby team, mm. one coach for the whole team. He did their fitness drills. They had a trainer. They had a strapping girl. That's it. Three people on the staff. Mm. Your coach is your coach. That's it. Here they've got f- 
eight coaches for the quarterbacks. They've got this many coaches for mm. the, the offensive diet. It's, a lot of money it's like, that, right? yeah. holy it's shit. It's more of a business too, It is. Right? It's a massive mm. business. But I feel like everything in America is a business. They're going all in. The point yeah. I'm trying to make is it is just all in and it's invested. Mm. Whereas I feel like it's just not the same because there isn't as many people in Australia. There's not as much money being projected to sport. Yeah. Like a high paying contract in Australia for rugby league is a hundred grand a year. Is it really? Yeah. Is that all? In America, you wouldn't even get out of bed for a hundred grand a year no, to play no, in the no. NFL. Well, what are the top players in America in Australia getting paid? Darren Lockyer, I believe, had the highest paid ever contract. He was a Hall of Famer. Yeah, yeah. Played for the Brisbane Broncos. Yeah. You, know, you know who he is. This guy was like the god of rugby league. Yeah. Everyone in New South Wales hated Mag- him. Magic. Everyone hands. else yeah. in the country loved him. Yeah. The guy was offered a six million dollar contract over the course of six years. Was he really? Yes. That was it. Six million over Damn. six years. Yeah, I, I'm not. I don't watch too much sports. I don't actually know what Australians get. That's not a lot of money. And when I was in Australia, I was like, "Holy shit! He got six million bucks to play football. That's awesome!" You come here, and then I came here, and I was like, "He got ninety-eight million dollars just to sign for the team. What the? F- it's mind blowing." And then you go to England, that like the football players, the soccer players, they're yep. at a whole different level of game. Exactly. All the golfers, like. Yep. And that's and interesting. Even, um, what's the the other super? Oh, baseball, baseball! My God, they get paid a lot, are they? Really obnoxious. Like, I I have the pleasure of knowing Albert Pujols, who's a Hall of Fame mm. uh, home run hitter here. Um, him and his wife uh, Deirdre, lovely people. They were actually investors in one of in one of my businesses over here. Yeah, um, they helped me out with getting that started. So forever grateful for those guys. Um, but Albert. That guy, you know, he's made over $300 million throughout his career. That's insane. And that's not even his endorsements. Mm. You know, that's just his, his contract. Just, with, yeah. Uh, and that's insane to me. Like, I, 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 I would love at some point in my life to have that type of money, but I wouldn't even know what to do what with it. What is it? it? Uh, Steph Curry. I think they're offering him a billion dollars. Something's floating around that they're about to offer him a billion dollars. That is insane. That's... <laughs> Like it's, 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 I mean, he's absolutely I mean, amazing. Amazing. But that's a but lot shit, of money. That's a lot of money. <laughs> it is. It is. And when you look at it's, it's funny that we're sitting here talking about this, and it's crazy. But as good as these guys are at their game, and they're they're good at their sports, and they're very tremendous athletes. It's. I still think it's too much, considering what other issues are going on in this country. Yeah, when you got doctors, nurses, people who have studied for <laughs> eight to twelve years, who yep. save people's lives, yep. who don't get well, paid. It, it, it just comes back down to society again, mate. What are we investing in? Mm. What are we investing our time in? What are we investing our energy in? So, if people didn't invest as much time and energy into it, they wouldn't get paid as much. Mm. It's just that simple because the money wouldn't be there. Do you, uh, in this country, every country, do you think the government, do you think the country wants people healthy or sick? Well, it's, I don't think the country wants sick people. Mm. I don't. I think there's a lot of big business within sick people, which is really disgusting mm. when you're coming to like the, talking about the drug industry. Um I think that there's a certain portion of government that wants sick people because they make so much money from it. Yeah. And without it, the country would be in absolute dire straits. Yeah. Um, so to, to answer your question, I'd have to say a little bit from column A, a little bit from mm. column B. I don't think anyone genuinely wants anyone sick. I don't think anybody needs that on their plate, especially when you've got 333 million people mm. in the country. Um but, you know, at the same time, if they really didn't want it, I think there'd be a lot more investment towards trying to fix it. Yeah. And I mean, you personally, you don't get sick very often, I'm guessing, right? Well, since I've lived here, mm. yes, I've How's been that? sick a lot more often. I actually just came off a stint of walking pneumonia that I didn't know oh, I Jesus. had from the beginning of November until about a week ago. Oh, wow. Yeah. So, um, before that, uh, I was sick last year. I had the flu, just normal, coming into winter. Yeah. Um, I normally get sick once or twice a year with like a flu or mm. some sort of sinus issue. But my sinuses, since I've lived here in the US, have been significantly worse than what they were when I lived in Me Australia. Me too. Me yep. too. <coughs> but I mean, I also live in Vegas. There's a lot of all these trees around. Yep. Actually, I want to jump in. You just did a, was that your first cold um, ice bath? Oh, yeah. That was the, the first official. You just, you just started that. The what, first official ice bath. What made you start that? 
So, I mean, obviously there's a lot of research that's gone into it with anti-inflammatory properties, yeah. um, you know, joint ailments, injuries, um, and just general well-being for the mind. Um, it really does create a massive brain spike and just gives you this oh, like adrenaline hit mm. as soon as that cold hits you. It's, you can't not get it. And it's kind of addicting. Right, it's 100% addicting. Yeah, 100% addicting going in and getting that feeling, that rush. But I was doing it and have been doing it because of my chest. Like I, I've come off this walking pneumonia situation and had a lot of inflammation in my chest. Okay. So I wanted to try and get that inflammation down as quickly as possible. So I've been doing that hyperbaric chamber and also infrared sauna. So, oh, no, very yeah, nice. I sit in the sauna for 15 minutes okay. and then jump into the ice bath and stay in there for a minute and a half mm -hmm. and then hop back out 15 minutes back into the ice bath. And I've done that three times as a rotation. Okay. Yep. Gotcha. Yeah, I've um, I've done cold showers for probably six years, and it's been fantastic. It's two things I want to touch on. I doing cold therapy, I stopped getting sick. Yep, I've been sick for six years. Yep, been doing cold showers for six years, but now I've got an ice bath out here. Yeah, I've been doing ice baths. It's my sixth day in a row. Yep, but um, the information, um, my breathing has improved dramatically. Yeah. Have you? Can you relate to that? I can a hundred percent relate to like, that because I couldn't breathe. You're breathing so much more without. And you, you, naturally, it's... I've had this fluid in my chest, in my lungs for... You think, okay, from the... From the pneumonia. And I've wondered why it just will not go away. And as soon as I hopped in that ice bath and did that first three rotations in there, yeah. I walked out of there and it just instantly started coming out. Like, and it gotcha. hasn't stopped coming out really? since... So between that and the hyperbaric, like that anti-inflammatory property for mm. your immune system from the hyperbaric and the extra oxygen, um, that's such a, a great combination just for longevity. Yeah, that's yeah. interesting. Yeah, I noticed I'll just be like driving. Or I was on Muay Thai today. I'm just, my recovery, my yep. ability to breathe is yep. tenfold. Yeah. And I, I didn't think I was breathing weird or shallow, but it it's in amazing That's, yeah i, I, <laughs> I mean there's all those benefits you talked about but just the breathing i was unaware of and if it's one thing that gets improved and it's not costing you an abundance of money and you know it's good for you and it's going to help with longevity then do it you know that's that's but the way hard. i view everything <laughs> oh it's hard it sucks I saw, I saw your video you're struggling yeah. every day um why am i doing this the first one you know and and i actually wanted to go back yesterday before i came out i didn't get the opportunity but i got the hyperbaric in and i looked at the cold plunge and i had that thought i was like oh fuck that's gonna be cold I don't have time. I instantly talked myself out of it and I was out the door. See oh, you so later. you didn't even do it? No, nah, I didn't do uh, it yesterday. Um, but when I get back, I, I fully plan on jumping so in. That's so funny. Yeah. It was, I think it was yesterday. It was my biggest struggle. I'm like, oh, I'll do it later. I'd like my mentally, I'm just like, just um, like rationing with myself, yep. bargaining with myself. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, screw it, just do it. Yeah, it's just it's hard sometimes. It's man. nuts. Absolutely. Um, your training and your, like you said, you evolve your training. What, what makes you different now and the way you train people, yourself, the way you diet, training? Um, like, where are you kind of at now? Now, like for myself, I've, all, I've actually always been the same way. I don't know. My wife referenced this. We were talking about 75 hard that Andy Frazella does, um, which is like 75 days of just setting yourself up to just do two workouts a day, um, make sure that you read 10 pages of a book every day. Yeah. And it's all about just being adherent to something. Okay. You know, long, long than, longer than two days, right? So 75 days, you got to do all these things. If you stop or if you mess up something, like you don't drink a gallon of water, you start your 75 days. Oh, again, okay. Right? So you've got to keep going through this cycle. Accountability. Right? For the accountability yeah. and just staying on point. I've always been that. Like I have an, a massive obsessive compulsive disorder when it comes to food, when it comes to training and when it comes to that, because where I started, I started overweight in high school. Oh, did you do? Yeah, man, I was bullied all through high school. And really? Yeah, it was, it was tragic. I did not like high school at all. It was really bad. My grades suffered. I was shit at school. Why, what uh, caused you to become overweight? Uh, honestly, I was just, in my head, like keeping up with my friends. So my friends were all skinny, little 
guys mm. and they all went through puberty really early whereas i didn't hit puberty until probably 18. oh really yeah okay. so i was a real late bloomer and that was also a big part of the bullying and the difficulty for that too so my weight gain came from wanting to do exactly what my friends did when they were going out to eat but because they were all going through puberty they were going through their growth spurts you know, their bodies were developing they could get away with it and you couldn't That's and i couldn't my body that didn't sucks, change and it didn't develop the same way that theirs did really? i did everything that they did i played rugby i played soccer i played tennis so you weren't eating excess food or doing anything no like, really? i think it really got bad when i hit 15 and I desperately wanted to get a job. Like I wanted to get in and I wanted to make money because I hated school and I just wanted to make money so I could buy shit that I wanted. Gotcha. My mum and dad were always really like constructively hard on us as kids, mm. making sure that we earned everything that we had. Yeah. So, and I think that's a vital lesson. You know, if, if I wanted something, if I wanted 20 bucks to go to the shop and, and do whatever, then I had to mow the lawn. Okay. And if I mowed the lawn and I told my dad, yep, it's done, he would come out and he would inspect the job. Nice. And he would look at it and he would purposely set the lawnmower at a certain height. And if I missed a spot, he'd drop it down one gauge, go again. Really? Get it right. But I mean, that's setting so up for lessons. life. So it's lessons. It's lessons, right? It's setting up for life. So going through all of that, as a young kid, that was like from eight years old, mind you. So eight years old is the first time I mowed the lawn. It's the first time I made my first 20 bucks. Gotcha. And I was pumped. So at that point, I started my first business, which was lawn mowing and car washing. Oh, really? In my street. I used to go at to eight. the neighbors every weekend and be like, can I mow your lawn That's for awesome. 10 bucks? Can I do this for 20 bucks? 10 bucks is a lot of money back then Fuck too. yeah, it was. You know, Especially and, for that. And all I was doing it for was to buy Warhammer figurines. These little things that I used to paint and stick together. And, oh, really? Yeah. It was just the weirdest thing, right? Yeah, yeah. But I needed money to buy that stuff. So I went out and I made the money and I worked for it. So my dad taught me, you know, the benefit of the work, but the reward from the work too. Mm. So when I turned 15, I got a job at KFC and... Coming back to KFC, I uh, I started working at KFC behind the cash register. Then they put me into burgers. Then they put me into cooking and I had all the skill sets and they wanted to make me a manager by the time I was 16 and a half. And I was like, I don't really want to be a manager of KFC. So you quit? No, I didn't quit. Oh, I stayed yeah. working there till I had another job. Okay. So from KFC, I ended up... Uh, getting my first job out of high school um which was a drafting job so autocad uh like building design that kind okay. of stuff so architectural drawings yeah um and i was designing uh sprinkler systems and fire alarm systems in, in high-rise buildings okay. so you know kfc was one of those things where it started i was eating the food getting more overweight mm. hanging out with my friends on the weekend driving them around to parties eating McDonald's late at night mm. with them and because I had the money to spend, I was just eating whatever I wanted and yeah. doing whatever I wanted at that time. So it really spiraled out of control to the point where I turned 17 and I was working at this uh, drafting place after I finished high school. I went to schoolies. You know what schoolies mm. is. Went to schoolies. I had a I know what schoolies is. dog I shit time at schoolies. <laughs> it was the worst week of my life. Oh, I just really? wanted to go home the whole time. Just because? Well, girls, girls you know. Girls weren't interested nah, in Nah, absolutely not. I was the yeah. chubby, overweight kid that was short, who, you know, had a, a not even a deep voice yet. And he's running around school. He's drunk, sounding like a twelve-year-old gotcha. girl. So that's interesting. It was it was tragic. Like my friends were hanging shit on me. Like I just I couldn't escape it. So that's interesting. Um, at that point, that's when things started to shift a little bit for me. But it wasn't done yet. I used I had so much negative energy coming out of that experience that when I turned eighteen, I then started going out and drinking a lot. Oh, I got you. So I was drinking and I was eating and I was going home and I was miserable because no girls were interested in me. Mm. And one day my roommate, because I moved out of home right after I finished high school too, yeah. my roommate said to me, he's like, you got to fucking do something with yourself, mate. And I was like, you're right, I do. And he dragged me down to the pool, swam some laps. I couldn't even do 10 laps of a 25-meter pool. So that's mm. half of an Olympic pool. I couldn't even do 10 laps. I had to stop every two and I just started building this momentum towards what it was that I thought I could get to. And he started talking about doing triathlons. 
And I'm like, <laughs> that competitive spike kicked, right? Yeah. I'm going to get a little bit competitive here because I have always been very competitive. I have an older brother. I had to always compete for, mm. for love. I had to compete for, for everything, when you got everything yeah. you know? So it was very competitive to a point where I was like, all right, I'm going to go ham at this. And when I compete, I'm all in. Like, mm. it's all or nothing. Otherwise, there's no point. I'm the same. So I started swimming. I started going to do extra laps, extra laps of the pool without him. I started taking myself there. I started yeah. doing more on top of what he was doing. Before six months was done, I think I dropped from like, I would have been close to 220 pounds um, down to around about 160 within six months. Nice. Just swimming at the pool. And then you I didn't started- change your diet or anything? No, I definitely changed okay. the diet. Yeah, so it's, after it's kind KFC, of created that momentum thing, right? Yeah, yeah after mm. KFC, he started talking to me about like when I was working with him, like, he would watch what I would get for lunch. I'd go to the cafe and just smash out on chips and shit. He's like, you can't do that. <laughs> He's like, you, that's you, so cool. You had him though. You're gonna you're gonna run yourself into a yeah. grave. Mate. He's like, get get a burger with a salad. He's like, I'll get a salad burger with you. He's like, I don't care. And I was like, oh, yeah, sweet, all right, cool. So I tried it and I liked it. So I started taking things out yeah, gradually yeah. so it wasn't such a culture shock like instead of getting chips with gravy i just get the chips and then the chips stopped and i'd just get the burger mm. and then it was instead of getting a chicken schnitzel burger it had then changed into a chicken breast sandwich with lettuce You're and then it just this. changed into the chicken and the lettuce because the more i started changing the food and I was still doing the same exercise, I started noticing how much more my body was changing. Mm, and then I became very, quickly. very obsessed with the food. And then it created a problem. Oh, wow. I'd cut my calories down. And I, I went back after I'd figured this out, right? I'd cut my calories down to around about 600 calorie intake a day. Oh, damn. That was from carrot sticks, lettuce, um, maybe a piece of fruit if I was feeling fancy and a couple of dry crackers oh, if, I, if I could. Wow. But it was also coupled with two to three hours in the pool, Yeah, about an hour of running every day and also cycling up to about 40 kilometers a day. Damn. So I was riding my bike. I was getting up in the morning at four in the morning. I was going for an hour run, which was about at that time I was very fast I was doing probably about 10 to 12K every morning, then getting on my bike without eating and riding my bike all the way to work, which was around about 40K. Mm. And then I would get to work, work all day, and then get back out there. I'd go for a 5K run, get back on my bike, ride all the way to the pool, and then jump in the pool and do 4K in the pool. Damn. So you, you can relate to a lot of people on a lot of different levels then from where you started. Yeah. So that's, that's probably what makes you a better trainer. I never had that. It it allows me to be able to tell, like really feel someone when they're telling me about what they're going through. Because yeah, the, I've been the there. mental health, the physical side, the food side. I like I was a skinny guy who started lifting weights when I was seventeen, and I just progressed. Yeah, that was it. Yeah, it's no fancy story behind it. Yeah, um, yeah. So I mean, that's got to be really beneficial as far as like helping people. It, it is. It, it's a it's a blessing. It's also a curse because, you know, those those little tendencies, they still trigger you every now and again. Mm, like, yeah, but there's still there's still some stuff there that I deal with on a daily basis that's not healthy in regards to that. Do you mind sharing that? You know, of course. No, like, I mean, it's 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 relative. Right. Like I've never been that I, I remember once or twice I maybe tried to throw up after eating. Really? Um, because my experience was if I eat this food, then I'm going to end up like that kid again. Gotcha. So it was an extreme so trauma. And yeah. the pain that I used to feel from being that kid, from being bullied and being teased and picked on mm. and all that stuff, that pain and that trauma, I was able to use to not want to go back to be that person. So in a, in a, in a sense, it was a great thing, but it was also extremely crippling and it mm. has been crippling ever since. That's interesting. But it's only in certain instances. Okay. Um, I now can control that switch a lot better. Yeah. Um, it's only when I'm coming out the other side of a competition that little fat Kai really wants to come out mm. and really skinny Kai takes over 
and then I play this really crazy battle with myself for yeah, about three I, or four weeks. I could imagine. And then it all calms down. Okay. So it's it's I just got to give it time to let it sort of go through its process. This time was nowhere near as bad as what it has been in the past. Typically right now I'd be sitting here blown up at about 235, 240 pounds and I'm still, you know, under 220. So mm. I'm feeling a lot better about the rebound process. Okay. The more times I do it, the better it gets kind of thing. Yeah, I think that with anything, right? Yeah. Oh, uh, that's, yeah, that's some crazy stuff. Yeah. Yeah, I always, <laughs> I mean, I was 17, started lifting weights. And I was like, hey, I want to get bigger. Yeah. What am I going to do? What am I going to eat? Starting to get more attention, starting more attention with girls, and it just progressed. Yeah. That's all there really was to it. And I was always that guy who was taller and bigger than everybody because yep. I'm the one who put the work in. But you had to go through a lot of ups and downs to, to kind of get to that path. Ebbs and flows, yeah. I mean, once I got down to being as skinny as I as I got, I was 114 pounds. <laughs> and I'd had a growth totally. spurt at that time. I'm 5'10". So Damn, that's, that's light at anyway. 100, yeah, 114 pounds is what I weighed in at, at my absolute lightest. And it was at that point my mum actually locked me in the car one afternoon when we were sitting outside Bunnings Warehouse. And she said, you've got a fucking problem mm. and you need to fucking fix it. And she cried. And I was like, oh, fuck. <sighs> so I went and got a doctor to, you know, tell me the same thing. Okay. You don't turn it around, you're probably going to die. Mm. And I was like, Sweet, that's all I need to hear. I I wasn't ready to die at that point. No, Seeing no. my mum, you know, cry. Like I was in a lot of pain, a lot of trauma. But seeing my mum cry at that moment made me realise that I'm, I need to be here because I've still got so much to do. I mean, nobody wants to make the mum cry either, right? No, absolutely not. It was a gut-wrenching. Um, but, uh, you know, at that point, I, I took myself off to the gym I had my first job as a, as a trainer at that okay. point, and I was at a gym called Bodywise, owned by Lorna Jane. Mm -hmm. um, she, uh, you know, she was instrumental in helping me get back on my feet, um, and that whole business. Uh, it was great. I met. Do so you actually know her? I know her personally. Oh yeah. wow, that's uh, amazing. She probably wouldn't remember me now. It's been so many years. But, I mean, if, but you if, if people don't know who she is, she's <clears throat> a badass entrepreneur. Yeah, in Australia. absolutely, massive, massive. Well, even here, like her clothes mm, sell here. Yeah, still. true. So, let me um, let me jump in. If someone's watching this and um, they're struggling with the eating, they're over exercising, they're being bullied, what what do you tell someone from what you're being through? Um, the thing I like to tell people is what what I have been taught is that people pick on you because they have their own problems. It's and insecurity, right? It's a massive insecurity on their half. You don't know what that person's going through, and you yep. don't know what they're going through at home. You don't know any of that stuff. And when you're a kid, you don't know any of that shit, right? No one ever tells you that because no. you're not even going to understand it anyway. Yeah. Um, but, you know, people will pick on somebody else and they'll put them down just to make themselves feel better. You don't need to live in their energy. Mm. I say how this all the time. I love hearing this. How you respond to it and how you deal with it. And I never knew how to deal with it because of other childhood trauma. Yeah. My big thing was get defensive, get defensive because my brother, he was always picked on too. He was short. He's shorter than me. Um, and, you know, he was always the skinnier kid, mm. but he had to always prove himself, right? So he always used to tell me, he's like, get aggressive, get aggressive. But he was the one at home being the aggressor and, and picking on me when I was a kid. Okay. So he thought he was toughening me up, but at the end of the day, it was literally just hurting me. Mm. Um, so instead of getting aggressive with kids, I'd, I'd be really mean to other kids so it's i would dish on. out yeah what i was receiving yeah. and i've done that you know traditionally through my whole life in in bits and bobs. And people generally do that right yeah so it's all coming from somewhere down mm. here and it's only when you can start to take responsibility for all of those things that you're going to be able to look at that situation and say he's got the problem not me mm. I mean, that's hard to do though, right? Incredibly difficult. Especially when you're young. Yeah. So mm -hmm. when when you're going through that, at the end of the day, like I can sit here and say, it's water off a duck's back. Don't worry about it. They're not your problem. If you're going to take it in, make sure you want to talk to someone about it. I mm. bottled that shit up for years. Who do you talk to about it though? Well, that's just the thing. You know, there's so many awesome things out there now where you can get online and do online therapy and i've i've signed up for that like okay. i do it so um, when, when did you get a healthy balance with your training your diet 
I mean, I mean, what do you call healthy? What do you call healthy, well, that's, mate? That's like, a question. My wife will sit a- here. If my wife was sitting here right now, she'd be like, he's fucked. He's <laughs> fucked in the head. He's absolutely fucked in the head. Like he will not even eat a piece of chocolate if it's in front of him, but then he'll eat a block of chocolate out of the fucking that's, nowhere. Yeah, that's me. So, I'm, I'm 110% in or 110% off. Yeah. So, and right now I'm off and I need a touch. But then around. like I'll eat that block of chocolate and then you'll see me on the treadmill the next day like... <laughs> It's okay. You don't need to try and burn off these calories. You can just do nothing and it's fine, but you're doing it anyway, you crazy motherfucker. I do a lot of fasting now, so if I have a cheat meal, I'll just fast for 24 hours. Yeah. Day, so. <laughs> I'll take an extra four hours of not eating. It's fine. <laughs> uh, so did you work out a... Um, did you refine something that, that worked for you that was yeah, somewhat I healthy? Think, I think what's really worked for me is like a 90-10 rule. Okay, like 90% so of the time on. 90% of the time I'm on. Like I drove out here. Most people would just drive out here and get some food on the way and get some snacks at the gas yeah. station or whatever. But no, I've got a microwave in my car and I have got my a meal preps. Yeah, I've got a fridge oh, in wow. my car. I've got a microwave in my That's car. That's awesome. So I packed all my meals. Um, I'm out here to train this weekend and, and I'm out here to work with my pro athletes. So I want to make sure I'm setting the right example for them. Mm. Um, so I packed all my meals. I ate my meals on the way here um i'm ready to go out for tea with one of my athletes after this that's and cool. is that jan no that's uh big chris um so chris robinson okay yeah so he uh you know it to me it's more important for me to stay on 90 percent because i live and breathe what i do mm. and if i want people to respect me then i want to be able to show them that this is how i live all the time that there's been also parts of my life where it's been a hundred percent all the time, but that's what got me to be able to be ninety yeah, yeah. percent all the time. So okay. I'll go through the whole week, man, like Monday through Friday, even even through Saturday, and then Saturday night I'll just eat. I'll go get a big piece of steak, sweet potato fries. I'll get a tub of Ben and Jerry's. I'll get some cookies. I'll do yeah. like whatever I feel like. Yeah, I'll just eat it. In that one sitting, yeah, I don't see it as binging because I don't want to go back to it the next day. Yeah, no, I don't, I would say I'm probably eighty five percent. Yeah, and that's that's, but I'm also forty three. Yeah, and I'm not competing. No, I see, mean, if I wasn't competing, I think I'd still be batshit. Um, I think I'd still be crazy. It's just well, one of those things ingrained in me. That was my struggle, right? Yep. I was doing modeling. I was doing fitness comps. I was in Thunder Down Under. Yeah. I was working bachelor parties. Yep. I was working every nightclub in um, Gold Coast, shirtless. Yep. yep. Whole bo- whole life revolved around the way I looked. Yep. And then when that went away, I was like, oh, I get, you got to, I, I needed a reason. Yep. I mean, I was still trained. I was trained forever. Yep. But to constantly eat clean. And I was doing the whole six meals a day, yep. lunch boxes everywhere. And then I have a daughter and it's like, your priorities change. I'm like, I don't want to carry a bag around for six meals a day in prepping, cooking, shopping. Yep. So that was my struggle and trying to figure out how do I balance this? And then intermittent fasting came along when I was 39 and that's been the best thing that happened to yep. me. And that's how I've learned to balance it. Yep. I eat maybe once, twice a day in an hour and a half to two and a half hour window. Yep. And that's what works. Yep. But it's liking that goal is where you can get lost. Yeah, I think for me, like, and this is where I think I differ a lot from a, a lot of fitness influencers. I don't even like calling myself that, but, um, or coaches or people like that. Like a lot of coaches will become coaches and then their training and their eating goes out the window. Like it, they're still training, but their eating goes out the window and they end up looking sloppy. And Why is that? Well, I don't know. I really don't know. I think it's like, oh, well, you know, my time's done. I don't need to be as serious about this anymore. Okay. But I don't see it that way because I want people to know that like the person they're working with is literally should be their biggest motivator. Yeah. Like, like a role I model, am turning by example. up every fucking mm. day to murder myself at the gym and I'm turning up every fucking day to murder myself on the Stairmaster and I'm going to look the way that I look, because this is how I love to look. This is what makes me feel the best. And I don't care what work it takes to stay in this shape. Mm. I'll stay in this shape because it's not only good for me, but it's also incredible for the amount of people that I want to try and touch to help them change their mindsets. Mm. Even if it's just by 10%, even if it's by 30%, even if I change someone from like not giving a fuck about themselves at all period to just wanting to go to the gym because they want a little piece of it 
Mm. That's what I care about because that's creating change. Yeah. Like, I don't care if, like, if you come to me and I give you a plan and I give you a nutrition plan and you message me on a Friday when you're supposed to check in, you say, oh, I fucked up this week, you know, I did this. That's okay because, you know, at the end of the day, you are human, okay? And that you haven't is okay. changed your yeah. you haven't changed your mindset yet to be ready to be 100%. Yeah. But what you're doing is still fucking better than what you did previous. Yeah. So let's stay with this until you don't want to do that anymore and you really want to create change like and that. step it up, okay? Because it all comes down to percentages. If you start at 100%, guess what? Your likelihood of failing is so much fucking higher it's basically than 100%. what it is if you start at 10%. That's a, I, I hear that in so many different ways, but I love how you put that. You put a hundred. You go from naught to a hundred. You're guaranteed to fail. Well, let's look at it in a fitness example. I'm not going to put one of my athletes on a stairmaster at 40 minutes straight away in a comp prep. Mm. Could you imagine the mental state that that person's going to be in at 12 weeks out? For the next 12 weeks, oh, yeah. for seven days, I have to get on a fucking Stairmaster for 40 minutes. That person is going to hate themselves yeah. because they know the only way that can go is up if they're going to get a result. Yeah, that's a, oh, that's a good point too. Yeah. Right? Or if you end up eating clean if, in your life and exactly. all of a sudden every if, meal is perfect. If you're going, okay, let's get your diet set first. Bang, here's your first week. Just get your diet at 100% for me for one week so we can see what your body does with this. Yeah. And then we'll start to look to make some changes. And at that point, if your body gets a great response, we don't need to change anything until it stops getting a great response. Mm. Whereas you might only be, that might only be like 10 or 15% better than what you were doing previously. Mm. You're still 10 to 15% better than what you were yesterday. So that's all that matters. And if your body's gauging great response from that, then stick with it till it doesn't, then step it up to 20. I like that. Put, put some more changes to the diet or just put some steps in for the day. Try and hit 5,000 steps today. Try and get active a little bit, right? Let's work on that now. And it, it just, it's adding to it rather than starting super high with this crazy expectation mm. that so many people have of what they need to do. No, like you're going to get, they're going to be those January gym goers that are in there for the first week and then fuck the next because they're sick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Their body, their immune system, there's so many things that go into that. There's a reason why flu season is January because gym people go to the gym, like unhealthy people go to the gym, they go balls to the wall the first week and they crush their immune system. Mm. And then they go, I hate the fucking gym because I got sick from it. Mm. And then they don't go back. That's and it's interesting. like, oh my God. That makes a lot of sense. It's, it's like trauma for them. Yeah. So uh, people are just going to continue to live in that because every time they go back to the gym, the same thing's going to happen. Yeah, that's- They're going to continue to go through that same revolving cycle. Very interesting. It's a pattern. So they need to break that pattern. They need to understand how to break that pattern. Mm. Um, you know, the business side of you. Mm -hmm. Talk to me about that. Um, yeah, I've done a fair bit. Um, I've had a couple of traditional You're jobs. You're really an entrepreneur, right? Yeah. From an I early mean, age. I mean, I don't, it's funny, that word to me, so many people throw it around. Mm. Um, but I mean, you got that entrepreneur spirit, yes. right? Or that I love, mindset. I love being able to inject my thought process into business to help create positive change. That's my outlook That's on it. That's a nice way of saying. And the first business I ever did it in was a complete mistake. Uh, I walked into a gym after getting back into the fitness industry. I spent some time actually doing landscaping when I was 20, oh, did, did, yeah. 20 through But like I mean, you, you knew the game because you saw when you're eight. <laughs> well, I just, you know, I wanted to get out and get active and do shit. So yeah. I don't know. It was weird. I was going to the gym. I was smashing that. I was playing rugby. That was just my life in a nutshell. Yeah. But then when I decided to get back into the fitness industry, I walked into this gym one day and I walked in and I was like, this is a beautiful facility. There's something missing here. And I'd worked in supplements before that at GNC, like I said. Yeah, yeah. And uh, there was no supplements there. Mm. So I said to the boss, I said to the owner, I'm like, hey, have you guys ever thought about like changing up what supplements you have and like getting some cool stuff in here that people are actually going to buy? Because I noticed there was dust on top of the oh, stuff. Gotcha. And I was like, do these even sell? He's like, oh, 
we don't really know too much about it. They're just kind of here. And I was like, yeah. well, I know shit loads about it. And he was like, really? And I was like, yeah. And I started explaining stuff to him and then people started coming up and listening and then people started buying shit. Oh, wow. <laughs> and then more people started joining the gym and then it just turned into this massive thing where like I was just making little manipulations to this business through mm. my boss and things just started clicking. And he was like, hey, can you go and manage the other location up in Rockhampton mm. and um, make it better? And I was like, fucking give it a red hot crack. <laughs> red hot crack. And this was legitimately the shittest gym you will ever walk into. Yeah. But the best gym at the same time. Something about it just felt grungy and dungeon like and it made you want to train really hard like, like it had all gyms. the old iron yeah, plates i like the old stuff it was just awesome and they had pictures of arnold and ronnie on the walls yeah and yeah it was a 24-hour gym uh ready 24-hour fitness uh rockhampton mm. uh, it, it changed my whole thought process and my whole career at that point I was helping people, uh, you know, in a traditionally very overweight town. I was trying to be the world's biggest bodybuilder. I knew everything about sports supplements. I knew everything about, you know, anything that anybody had to ask me a question about sups or training. Mm. I was your guy, you know, like everybody in town was coming to that gym for that purpose. And I yeah. was just, I loved it. It was awesome. And then I went into supplements full time. Again, mm. I went away from the gym and I went into supplements again. And that was a mistake. Um, but it led me to opening my own supplement shop. Okay. Um, and that was my first actual, like, legit business. What was that called? It was called High Performance Supplements, okay. HPS, uh, in New Farm. Um, so we opened up a store. I was actually a rep for a supplement company called Cyborg Sport. Yeah. So Cyborg uh, started with Mike Swenson. Um, I can't remember the other guy's name, which is really bad. He was a really nice guy. Marcus. Marcus Eason. Okay. And uh, those two guys slogged it out for years by themselves trying to build up this brand. Scott Goebel, um, Australian pro bodybuilder. Yeah. Oh, no, he wasn't a pro. He never made it pro, but he was like the best bodybuilder in Australia. Yeah. Um, he was their sponsored athlete. I wanted to be an athlete. I loved this product. So when I was working at High Performance Supplements in uh, – Paddington, that was the original mm. location with Rowan. He got me linked up with the boys. They gave me a job as a rep, and I was like, "Sweet, I'm I'm a protein rep. This is dope." Yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah, I I ended up wanting to open the store and have Cyborg in the store. I got fired because of a conflict of interest, mm. um, but they helped me out and got me the stock that I needed to get the shop started. Uh, my ex, she actually funded the project with four thousand dollars. Yeah. Um, we used the $4,000 to outfit the shop. Um, it was a fucking dungeon. My parents owned the building. So they gave us a little bit of leeway oh, nice. on the rent a little okay. bit. Um, so we got the signage done, um, with a 90 day term with my friend, Mark. We had the shop fit out. We had $4,000 worth of stock and the rest was history. It just built and built and built and built. And I got it built all the way up to about 120 gram worth of stock value within 12 months. Nice. Just investing back into the business. Um, and during that time, uh, a guy had reached back out to me from the same town and said, hey, I need you to come back up here and build a gym for me. And I was like, shit. Uh, okay, how do I do that and have this shop? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So my ex jumped into the shop. She was working the shop. I was flying up there every week uh for two or three days and then looking through his business and seeing what was wrong with it yeah and the, it was just funny man like the, i walked in there the first day the girl behind the counter um she was obviously not in a very good mood that day i didn't tell her who i was um i just walked in started sussing things out looking around and she's like what well, do you do you, do you want to work out and i was like oh no nah. I just wanted to come check the gym out, see if I liked it. And she goes, oh, you're going to be in town long? I said, oh, just for the next few days. And she goes, oh, okay. I said, I do need to train though, so can I use the gym? And she was like, it's going to cost this much. I was like, yep, sweet. And she goes, I don't know why my boss charges, blah, blah, blah. And then she started going off oh, geez. about my friend. Just unloading. And then yeah. it was just a massive unload. And I was like, holy shit. I just took in this girl's life story. Yeah. And I was like, what's going on here? Because he was having issues. He's like, I can't get members to come in. I don't know why people are complaining. Mm. Something's not clicking. We can't get the business to where it needs to go to. 
And I was like, just let me come in and look. Yeah. Seed. Bad fucking seed. Right at the front. Huh? Right at the front. And it was just like, bang. I said to him, called him that day. I said, get rid of her. She's bad egg. Mm. She's talking shit on you. It's. I don't think people realize how, how how much one person can affect a business. 100%. Well, when you're talking shit on the owner, who's mm. also the local publican, so he owned the local hotel and pub, mm. that's not a good place to be. Yeah. Because now there's becoming this toxic nature where she's creating a side for her and a side for him. And with people not wanting to go to the gym and hear her talk shit about the guy that they love at the pub, yeah. it just wasn't creating a good atmosphere. Yeah. So we got rid of her. We changed up a lot of things within that business. Um, got all the right equipment in there, in the right places. Started building a few things out. Built a supplement store in there. Um, and with a, a, a country town within 18 months, I had that business operating at, I think, 80 grand of net profit on a quarterly basis. Nice. Um, which is huge for 10,000 people. Yeah, yeah. You know, that's the population. The gym itself only had very minimal members, mm. but... Is it just a natural <clears throat> skill that you've got, you think? I mean, just identify those things and tweak things, I mean... Well, you, you look down to the basics of customer service. Mm. Customer service is everything. So if your customer service is shit, your business is going to be shit. Mm, okay. If you're not invested in your business, your business is going to be shit. Okay. If you're not putting customer service in the right places within your business to make sure that people can see value within your business, your business is going to be shit. So it's so incredibly important to make sure that customer service is at the forefront of any business, regardless okay. of what it is. Because if it's not, people are going to look for it elsewhere. Because what do people want? What do people need, especially in fitness? Help. Mm. They need help. It's funny you say that, like... Um is it fitness first back mm -hmm. home? Yeah. Yeah, I remember um, it's not till you go to leave the gym that they're the, your best friend. Yeah. Oh, is there anything we can do? Blah, blah, blah. Yeah, do you want to buy anything? But you haven't heard a peep from them since you st since you joined up. Absolutely and not. And by the time you're ready to leave, it's too late. Yeah. But if it's just a little, any type of check-in, any type of you know, it's all, effort. It's all well and good to say hello to someone as they walk through the door, but you mm. don't even get that here in America. <sighs> You know, I've walked into, I can't count, besides today, because the guys know, uh, knew that I was coming into Dragon's Lair. Yeah. The dude behind the counter was like, Kai. And I was like, what's up, bro? And, you know, he came out from behind the counter and greeted me. Yeah. That's customer service. Regardless of whether you know the person or not, stepping out from behind something to get in somebody's face to make them feel welcome like you are their equal mm. is so massive. And if so many more people here in this country realize that, their businesses would become so much better. It's it's so nice to hear you say that because people do not say hi to you. I was taught that from like- It's just- I was four years old going to these- or at six years old, going to these golf things with my dad and my mum, and my dad putting me in front of these old people who are rich, successful people in the air conditioning mm. industry, I had to grow up quick. Like, I had to grow up real quick. Like, my dad said to me, he's like, you don't put your hand out and shake someone's hand, you're going to be in trouble. Mm. All right, yep, sweet. Introduce yourself. I'm not introducing you to anyone. You introduce yourself. Mm. You're a man, you do that. And it's just, it's ingrained in me to be want to be there with people. That's and when we say, hi, how are you? We actually care. Yeah, not I'm actually asking, like, how are you? Not trying to get tipped, not trying to sell your network no. marketing. Ugh. I've literally been at shops where we're looking at each other in the eyes mm -hmm. and they're there too. <laughs> they work at the shop and we're literally playing stalemate. Yep. I'm like, I'm not going to say anything until you say hi. Are you going to greet me? Are you even going to treat me like a human being? I yeah. go through this all the time. It drives yep. me freaking crazy. Do you know that if I own that business, I would want to know yeah. how bad that person is. There's a large population of Americans that actually believe that someone coming into your house should greet you. That's interesting. Why the fuck would I that greet you if I'm sense. coming into your house? Mm. I'm coming into your house. Say something to me as I'm coming in your door. Like, why are you coming through my door? And if you're expecting me, hey, man, how you doing? Come yeah, on in. Welcome. <laughs> Like it's yeah, it's nice to hear you say that because it blows my mind sometimes. I went into a supplement shop a week ago. There's two guys that I've seen that work there. One of them, brilliant. Every time I walk in, hey bro, what's going on? How you doing? You need any help? Can I point you in the right direction? What are you looking mm. for? Fuck yeah, thank you. The other guy looks at you and then puts his head back down. It's like, hey man, he's like, so like he's not getting employee of the month. 
right? And that I guarantee you the days that that guy is in the store, sales are traditionally significantly lower than oh, what the other guys are. That has to be for sure. Absolutely. Mm. I, something I, I, I really believe is people, I'm getting paid the minimum, so therefore I'm going to do the minimum effort. 100%. And it doesn't work like that back home. No. But You've got a job and this is what you do. Here's, here's the caveat to that. You go to work at McDonald's. I keep bringing McDonald's up. I must be craving McDonald's. <laughs> you go to work at McDonald's as a casual employee over the age of 18, you're getting paid $24 an hour. Mm. You go to McDonald's in America as a casual employee over the age of 21 years old, and you're not getting paid any more than $12.50. Mm. There's a big difference. But things are a lot cheaper here too. There are, but it's still a big difference. Mm. Like what incentive do you have to really want to work when you're getting paid fuck all? Mm. Right. So some people have a natural ability to just want to do it. And they're the people that should be doing those jobs, but they should also be significantly highly rewarded. Mm. Um, and I think that that's a big thing that's also missing here too within businesses because business owners are so greedy with the money that they're making, yeah. they don't want to invest into the good people a lot of the time. Some yeah. companies are great for it, but when it's a small mum and pop like business, they can't afford to do it yeah, realistically. Yeah. So they'll take anyone who's willing to work for the cheap price, but they don't understand how much that drastically affects their business. Mm. That's the mistake that, that they're yeah, making. So you're saying if you pay some, if you pay someone, you Give pay the right some person. Incentives. Yeah, you pay the right person the right amount of money. That's on the back end. You're making. Tons you're going to make more. way more in the going long back run. to the supplement shop. Yeah, yeah. If someone literally says hi, how are you? How can I help you? Every single time and yep. actually give a shit. Yep. You're going to make more sales. Exactly. There's and they're going to come back and they're going to tell their friends. There's a reason why companies like ASN. Uh, Australian Sports Nutrition, uh, Nutrition Warehouse, all those companies back in Australia that do, you know, millions of dollars in sales a month in supplements, there's a reason why they do them and there's a reason why they don't here. There's mm. a reason why so many brick and mortar supplement shops close down here or don't do big, big, big business is because people don't get off their asses and move from behind the counter. Mm. It's one simple thing. I mean, the supplement I go to, one of my best friends manages the store and yep. we're best friends now because he talked to me. Yep. He helped me. Yep. He came out from behind the counter. Yep. So think about it that way. Mm. Like there's a lot of business that a lot of business owners out there. And if they do hear this, if they change those small things just about customer service, greetings, goodbyes, thank yous, general manners that no one seems to actually have mm. here then their businesses will grow mm, because that's what people want. They want to that. feel loved. Human interaction. They want to feel accepted. They want to feel safe. Treated like a human being. Exactly. As simple as that. So they probably don't get it anywhere else. So yeah. they walk in the stores and when you get it, it's just like, ah. <laughs> You'll sometimes get the people who are dressed like absolute bums that walk into a store and you treat them no differently to anybody yeah, else because yeah. you don't know who you they are. You never know. Look at you. You're in sweats. Exactly. I'm in full sweats, bro. You're in sweats. I don't even give a <laughs> shit. <laughs> I could have turned up in short shorts, whatever I wanted. I wouldn't care. It does not matter. No. Nah, I'm still going to treat you the same way. You're still going to treat me mm. the same way because I'm a human being. I that was... person who's a bum, they might be or look like a bum. They might be a millionaire. They might have your highest sale for the day. Yeah. So you don't know. You don't know. Don't treat them any differently mm. to anybody else just because of the way that they're dressed or the way that they walk into the store or if they seem weird. Never assume anything. Yeah. I was at um, Borders the other day getting a book. Yep. Lady was amazing. Yep. Best lady I've come across in the last 12 months. Yeah. So friendly, so helpful. And she even spent another five minutes talking books and quotes and stuff afterwards. It's amazing. Yeah. But that is so rare. But that was a, that's a pretty normal thing to happen back home. Oh, hundred percent. You, mm. <laughs> I could have, I could count, I couldn't even count the amount of times that I've walked into a coffee shop in Australia without then walking out with the person making the coffee's name, their fucking girlfriend's name. Yeah, a good five ten minute chat, right? Yeah, great chat over coffee i'm going back the next day for the coffee i'm going back for the chat mm. you know and you do you build relationships that's how relationships are formed and that's called retention retention of customer and yeah. i will <sighs> never return to a store unless i get good customer service yeah if you, i'm not going back for food 
I'm going back for the experience. Yeah. I, I can cook the food at home myself. I'm yeah. quite handy. <laughs> but if I go to a high-end restaurant, this is the thing I hate. Like, there's expectation now, right? Expectation to tip. Why? Mm. You didn't earn it. I have struggled you, with that. I, mate, the way I grew up, do you think I want to tip anyone? Mm. Mate, I had to mow the lawn three times just to get 20 bucks mm. just because I missed one blade of grass. Yeah, that's something I struggle with, that, like, expecting to be tipped. Yeah. I mean, if you do a fantastic job, absolutely. Yes. But if you're just on the bare minimum and you expect, that's that's Don't turn up with a check that says 20% gratuity automatically applied to your bill. Mm. Like, fuck off. And don't turn up to my table with a minimum expectation for a 22% tip. Like, you're literally having a laugh. This expectation thing, it needs to stop. It needs to stop. If you're doing a great job because you're a server and people know that you get tipped for doing your job, just fucking do your job right. Mm. Do it really good and do it awesome way better than everybody else and you're going to make the most money yeah don't make it an expectation where you're going to turn up to somebody's table give them mediocre service and expect to get paid it's still expect yeah i understand there's so many things i want to touch on so i want to try to touch on a bunch yeah. of different things <laughs> that's okay so uh i saw you training jen using mm -hmm. the machine you're yep. hooking her up to the always wires i've seen it before can you talk to me about it yep so the newbie is what they call neurological bioenhancement technology. Okay. So essentially what it's doing is it's programming the brain to really harness the movement of the muscle. That's how it, the muscle moves. Like our brain tells our fingers to do this, like yep. muscles to operate, to lift, whatever. But the strength of that connection becomes amplified through intensity. So it's directly forcing the muscle to work and bypass all pain barriers because it switches off the Golgi tendon. Oh, uh, bypassing the pain barrier. Yes. Really? Yes. So That's it works very differently to a standard stem machine. The stem machine traditionally will contract the muscle and force a contraction, but it never really has any way of taking you back through the eccentric phase. Okay. So they call it AC and DC current. Um, stem machines work through an AC current, which is contractual, the newbie works through DC, which is eccentric. Gotcha. So it's, yes, forcing the muscle to work and tense at 100% capacity at then a different level of intensity. You can range it from zero to 100 on top. Mm. So it's getting your mind to muscle connection at 100% and then you can lift the intensity of what that is through the, through the gauge on the machine. Gotcha. So when your f muscle is fully flexed, you then have to force back against it through that tension to create the tear down of the muscle to create, you know, new movement pattern, new, new nerve response, all that type of stuff gotcha. within the muscle. Say for example, you went in a, you were in a car crash, you suffered extensive damage of atrophy from having a broken leg. Yeah. And you've been in a giant cast for however long that leg, the atrophy on that muscle is going to be intense. And it's gonna take months of physical therapy to even get it close back to what this is. The newbie can get it done in weeks. Really? Yes, back to normal in weeks. Wow. There's been examples, Brad Rowe, uh, professional bodybuilder. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether it's still his girlfriend or wife or, but Steph, his partner at the time, uh, she was getting ready to compete for her pro card. Uh, she was sitting on a shoulder press at Gold's Gym, reverse, uh, doing shoulder press in the front, one of the hammer press loaded ones. She went up for a press with three plates on each side. The seat dropped out from underneath oh, her geez. and literally ripped apart her oh, adductors wow. and crushed her spine. Oh, jeez. Doctors said that she'd be in a wheelchair for minimum six to eight weeks and then she'd start physical therapy but she wouldn't be able to get back to training for at least six to 12 months wow brad had her walking fixed pretty much back in the gym training within six weeks wow so you're talking recovery being one and also the future of bodybuilding potentially i i would have to say that the newbie machine is the closest thing to the fitness industry's magic pill really it expensive it, incredibly um how much you but have? no actually you know what no it's not an expense it's it's an investment okay. right it's a true investment how much is the investment the investment is twenty thousand. okay uh, for a machine um but the benefits that you get from that twenty thousand, uh the education that you gain through that you know 
instructional phases of going through how to learn how to use a machine, putting it to practice, what it's actually capable of. Like you can do water therapy, you can do deep tissue massage with it, you can do occipital resets, you can do uh, you know muscle building, you can do muscle stretching, you can do muscle you know uh, mobility with it. Really? There's so many benefits to using this machine that that's why I like to call it an investment because it's gotcha. again broaden the horizon of my my potential business because i've been able to learn so much more about how mm. i can help people stay in the gym want to be in the gym and actually get tangible results from things they've never gotten tangible results from interesting and then obviously you're probably elderly being a huge one right what well, uh, elderly, elderly well i've never worked with i've worked with one elderly lady too sorry my mother-in-law and also a lady called rosalie from big bear she had frozen shoulder from using a snow shovel one okay. day when she was trying to get the snow out of her driveway she hit the ground jammed her shoulder and she wasn't able to move her shoulder from this position okay not up not down not to the side nowhere so she was literally one-armed at yeah. 68 years old living by herself damn so she used to drive down to me once a week and i literally just used to strap the newbie to the sites of where we could get most pain localized yeah because it has a discovery on it as well where you can literally localize impingements really yeah so i need if, one of these things. yeah if you had a bicep impingement i would be able to locate where that impingement actually is and then know where to put pads so that we could then fix it That's within good. the space of 30 seconds wow so it's very quick it's very effective and it gets you moving immediately um this lady went from having a complete frozen shoulder after three sessions was able to actually lift her arm above uh her three head sessions. height after three sessions wow and three sessions were, so it went for how long uh 45 minutes Damn. traditionally wow yeah. that's crazy the so notice this, this is a longevity thing too, it's, right? it's a massive longevity thing for training too like mm. not just in perspective of of mobility but for training because you don't need to lift the same weight mm. we all know the one thing that really kills us from getting to the gym every day long term is our joints and all that sort of stuff they start to give up you yeah. start to get those impingements when you're using the newbie it's like the ultimate cheat code because it constantly keeps everything fully elongated mm. so you're never really getting too tight because you never have to lift the same amount of weight as what you do if you have the machine's intensity so it's that already getting the muscle, muscle connection and what, it's beyond that what's the biggest difference between a pro bodybuilder and an amateur bodybuilder I don't obviously know. time mm. right but some have that genetic ability to get so much more muscle yeah it's because they have a much higher ability to be able to tap into a mind to muscle connection while they're training so the average human being I, I read something one day, it was like a 30% connection that they can have with a mind to muscle connection. Professional athletes, like 40 to 50%. So they're a little bit higher. With the machine, I can take you to 100. So you, you're saying you can take an ordinary person <clears throat> extraordinary? Very quickly. Really? Very quickly. That's interesting. I even did it on myself. I have the worst genetics that mankind has ever seen. I traditionally came from 114 pounds. I don't have it's good knees. I don't anything. have a massively good frame. I've got a blocky waist. But one thing that I saw, and this is during COVID, so no gyms were open. Yeah. I had a Bowflex. And I'll have to share the picture with you and you can, you can upload it or whatever. But the difference that I saw in the eight-week period using the newbie four times a week in training on a fucking Bowflex... What is a Bowflex? Bowflex is that Chuck Norris thing with the things, oh, the cables that you pull. Yeah, and it's like, I'm racking my brain. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I had one of those about. in my, my garage. That was your workout. That was my workout but on you a Bowflex. Up to the... I was training back using a Bowflex and I was training chest using a Bowflex, doing three exercises per body part, four sets over three exercises. That's it. 12 working sets per, per body part. Yeah. My body transformation over the course of those eight weeks stuck at home was better than the previous 12 months really? that I had had in the fucking gym and I hated myself I for do. so long. I was like, why, why have I waited so long to do this? So are we all going to be wheeling this machine around with us soon I, I once don't, it comes down I mean, in price? 
It's one of those things like it's a medical grade piece of equipment. So you have to be licensed to be able to use it on other people. Okay. I do believe they let certain people purchase them for their own personal use. Um, But with such a high level of expense, and I don't see that going anywhere. Okay. Um, You know, people are still using them for their businesses. So they've always promised us that they will never undercut prices so that they can be so readily okay. available. Like you've really got to have the money to be able to get one. Gotcha. Yep. Um, and then just to kind of finish <clears throat> off with, what's your opinion on all these bodybuilders dropping dead? Like, is it, is it just social media and it's more, it's more open and more people are hearing about it and it's always existed? What's your, what's your thoughts on this? Um, so I'll take this back to my own personal experiences Again, I think it's a little bit easier for me to relate because I'll admit my own faults, right? I have taken a lot of responsibility over my last comp prep um, because I was so unhealthy coming out the other side. Um, And I think it's important for people to understand that even as a coach myself, I still had a coach. I don't blame my coach. It was not his fault. I put into my body what I put in my body and and that's my responsibility to take, take responsibility for that um wholeheartedly i did less drugs going into this last show than i've ever done okay but the fact that i was walking around with pneumonia not knowing it from the beginning of november all the way through both of my comp preps really didn't help the problem i just didn't know i had something that wrong okay um so you know my health on the other side got to a point where i had some quite alarming health risks um, you know, it was saying that I had a lot of inflammation in my chest, around my heart, uh, my CRP1 proteins were extremely elevated, granulocytes, lymphocytes, they were elevated, which shows a massive immune dysfunction. Um, kidneys were slightly elevated, liver was definitely elevated. You look at all of these things and you start to think to yourself, this is fucking crazy. Like I'm literally at a high risk for a heart attack coming out of a bodybuilding show that I won and I got a plastic trophy. Why? And you're in your 30s. And I'm fucking 35 years old. And you got a right? wife. I got you a wife. You haven't children yet. No, I haven't got children yet. You haven't seen your grandchildren. Like- no, I haven't seen anything. Mm. I haven't even seen my family for six, nearly seven years. Mm. So, you know, when you're looking at all of these things, you start to ask yourself, okay, the sport in itself, we all make choices. Mm. Some make great choices. It's not all. Some people's bodies are just not built to take drugs. Mm. I'm going to put it out there straight away. That's interesting. Some people's bodies, like I tell everybody, we do not have the same structure inside and out as everybody else. Mm. Okay. Just because it makes it okay that Phil Heath is seven-time Mr. Olympia doesn't make it okay for Kai to try and be seven time Mr. Olympia because mm. his body just won't fucking go there. Okay. Right? And no matter how many drugs you put into it, and trust me, I've done them all, mm. right? I've done them to excess. I've done them all and I'm happy to admit it to hopefully tell someone else that may be in the same boat to just fucking stop. Gotcha. Hence the reason why I scaled myself back from bodybuilding to men's physique. Okay. I love competing. But I love you competing. Keep, you don't drop dead. Okay. I don't want to fucking die from it. Yeah. Okay. Right? I don't. Gotcha. But, you know, you put you're it into... Very pers- mat- you're being very mature. Yeah, well, you it. put yeah. it into perspective. Well, mate, I've got a lot of people that love and care about me, you know? No mm-hmm. one's reliant on me, but I've got a lot of people that love and care about me, so I know that they would be incredibly hurt if I was selfish and took that away from them because I was irresponsible. Mm. So do you think with the other bodybuilders, it is just people taking too much drugs or you think it's people are not- It's not that. It's or you the think fact it's a that there's just of- no fucking money for these people to do everything that they need to do to stay healthy. Okay. So bodybuilding as a whole, the only person who's ever fucking making money out of the bodybuilding shows is the promoters. Mm. They're like, we want to give you all this stuff back. Fuck off. Like you're doing it for money. It's a business. Yeah. We all know that. We're not yeah. stupid. Start giving some more money back to the athletes so they can really start taking care of themselves. Okay. Like, I can't tell you how many times I've had guys come to me and say, you know, bro, I've been on this cycle. 
blah, blah, blah. I just want to get massive. And, and it's like, okay, well, have you had blood work done recently? And they're like, no. Nah. I'm like, how long have you been on cycle for? Oh, like 26 weeks. I'm like, what the, f- you haven't taken a break? Like these people, they have no idea that they mm. need to manage their fucking health. They've literally had it pumped into them that they need to get to be the biggest, baddest bodybuilder tomorrow. Again, mm. it comes down to fucking tomorrow. Yeah. That they forget that there's another day after that mm. and another day after that. Like, I can't stress to people how important it is to take your time with this shit and manage your health just as much as you want to manage the building side of it. Mm. You need to manage your health twice as much as what you manage that side because I've neglected this side in the past and it's got me nowhere short of high risk for a fucking heart attack at 35 years old. So realizing there's consequences. Well, I've realized there's consequences many times. I knew there was consequences going into it. I never do anything without knowing what the repercussions could be. The first time I put a needle in my ass, I knew there was going to be repercussions of that at some point. Yeah. There's always going to be. But guys are not looking at those repercussions seriously. I never looked at those repercussions seriously. Gotcha. Until it got to a point where someone said, hey, you're being a fucking idiot. You need to slow it down a little bit, champ. Mm. Otherwise, you're not going to be able to slow down. You're just going to stop. Mm. No, I, I appreciate you being so kind of real and honest with that because mm. I think a lot of people need, need to hear that. They definitely need to mm. hear it. Like, and I've said this before. I had a friend drop dead at 32. And he was my mentor as far as training, diet, and I was my early 20s. So that was my wake up call. Yeah. That's where I was like, holy crap. He's 32. He's got a wife. He's got a baby. And now he's dead. Yeah. It's gone forever. Yep. So I was able, I was lucky enough. I don't like to say lucky enough, but lucky enough to see that firsthand where I'm like, it always kept me in check. Mm-hmm. But yeah, it's just very upsetting to see these people live and breathe health. Yeah. Who but- are not healthy. So I always wonder, was it the drugs? Was it party drugs? Was it just- I think it just comes down to- Some people not handling certain things. Some people over training. Some people not doing blood work. Well, there's a lot of that too. There's, you know, there's so much pressure on these, you know, pro athletes. I don't even know why they call themselves pro athletes. Like it's dumb. Like in grand scheme of things, like, yeah, you're in the the elite and you have the opportunity now to earn money. Mm. That doesn't scream professional to me. That just screams that, oh, you are now part of an elite group of people that are better than other people and we can now make enough money at these shows to be able to pay you Mm. because they're big enough and you're popular enough. So we'll give you a little bit of the massive amounts of profit that we'll make Mm. just so you can get up here and do it again next year. But we don't care about health. We don't give a fuck about your health. Yeah, that's another business. It is a whole other business. and. I know that there's a lot of guys out there, bodybuilders, who are, you know, telling people, make sure that you get your health checked, but it's not prevalent enough. Okay. It's not prevalent enough within the social media influencers. It's definitely prevalent within the professionals, but for some reason, no one's listening to them. No one's going to these people who have that real education. They're just Mm. going to these influencers who are taking crazy amounts of drugs, and telling people to, that they're not even doing them, uh, telling well, them they're say, natural. They don't want to share the fact no. they're doing it. <clears throat> because it makes them unrelatable. Mm. It makes them unrelatable to all the people that help them make money. Mm. Whereas, yeah, yeah. A protein powder is now. Yeah. Exactly. You know, you protein's what's doing this for me. Liver. The liver king. Yep. Perfect example. Idiot. Perfect example. Such an idiot. Everyone like you and I, we all know, but- yeah made a lot of money absolutely and what about all those people mm. what, like how much of a dickhead would you feel like if you bought into that and then mm. you started telling other people that it was legit and so many people did so i know millions did. of people did <laughs> millions yeah like yeah i mean it, it's it's crazy to me that people are still so in tune with the conditioning that they get from their peers and society mm. like we as a group, we as fitness, we need to start putting the real message out there, the real stories, telling people the dangers, living through those experiences, learning from those experiences to get better to help somebody else who might be in that. That's what it should be, but it's not. It's who can sell the most shit to yeah. brainwashed people who have got- To make the most money. To make yeah. the most money. Yeah. It's mind boggling. Dude. 
Thank you for your time, man. No, I appreciate absolutely. you coming My around, man. That yeah. was a um, pleasure. <laughs> it's good to catch up with some Aussies. Yeah, definitely. So, Anytime, yeah. man. It was good fun. Thank you.